of quarters, dollar bills, and on the great seal of the United States. The bald eagle became an American icon after the founding fathers made it the national emblem in 1782. Despite its symbolic significance, the bald eagle population plummeted in the 1960s and 70s, and it faced a very real threat of extinction. By 1979, just four nesting pairs remained in all of Ohio. Forty years later, hundreds of bald eagles soar over the state's landscape and nest near our lakes, rivers, and streams. Ideastream's Stephanie Jarvis explores the eagle's path to recovery, widely regarded as one of America's greatest conservation success stories. If there was a, if it was one of them sitting in the tree right now, you can actually see them right here. Chuck Anderson drives bus 85 for Willoughby East Lake Schools. All right, be careful. Have a good day. Have a good day, Dominic. Between stops, he keeps an eye out for two of East Lake's most popular residents. We've caught them in the trees over here as I dropped them off too. It's, it hasn't happened too many times, but there has been times when we've caught them in. Elsie's tree or the lake tree. He's talking about kindness and justice, the pair of bald eagles that took up residence here in the fall of 2016. It was during a layover between routes that Anderson first spied the majestic newcomers. When I pulled in down here about three years ago, we started seeing the eagles coming and building the nest. Uh, at that time, I didn't even have a camera. I had an iPad. Um, I got out my bus one day and walked over. This was before any of the boundaries or anything were up around here. So I, would, I walked over and I took a picture of the nest with my iPad. Stick by stick, the two constructed an intricate nest on the edge of Bruce Yee Park. The former baseball diamond now serves as a protective barrier for the eagles. Much to the delight of the town, the couple returned to the nest each of the past three winters. They're now celebrities to many locals who come every day with cameras and binoculars in hand. We don't have a eagle cam like some of the other nests do, so we are the eagle cams for this nest. I get up like before the sun comes up, and I'm usually here at the nest before these guys start flying around. And I like to be here to try to catch them before they fly away so I know exactly what direction that they go in. That's the lake tree there. To monitor potential eggs or eaglets, Anderson and other eagle enthusiasts like Elsie Brockett have developed their own method of surveillance, tracking the eagles throughout the day, sitting in trees, grabbing fish at the lake, or soaring in flight, then sharing observations and photos with Facebook groups dedicated to the birds they named Kindness and Justice. Anderson and Brockett even named a number of trees where the pair spend time. This is Bill tree right here. This is their most popular tree right here. The nest is less than two miles from Lake Erie, and a short walk or flight from the Chagrin River. And according to the residents here, the nest at Bruce provides the perfect manage point for capturing that breathtaking image. We have kind of a unique atmosphere here where the eagles have chosen to nest in a, kind of in the foreground, so you can see them easily. There's not a lot of branches. The hardest photography to me is catching birds in flight, so I've been hanging out here trying to hone my skills a little bit. <laughs> One of the best things that happened to me happened this year. I was taking pictures of the eagles, and there was two little kids by their car back there that said, I see it, I see it. And I just, it just touched me, and I couldn't take any more pictures that day. I was done. Last year, Kindness and Justice successfully produced two eaglets. This year, it appears two clutches of eggs failed. But Anderson says he'll continue to follow the eagles and share what he's learned with others. I have a school of kids up here, the kindergarten kids, that follow my videos and uh, the photos that all these great photographers out here take. Miss Stitz is the uh, kindergarten teacher, and her class follows all of my stuff. Growing up as a kid, I was never able to see an eagle in my lifetime, you know, up close like we are seeing them now. I'm amazed at the kids today, how they're able to see this right in their backyard. Massive nests like the one in East Lake occupy treetops all along the Lake Erie shoreline and nearby bodies of water. This nest in the Ohio and Erie Canal Reservation, discovered last year, marks the first active eagle's nest in Cleveland in more than a century. Moving west, eaglets feast in a more secluded location at the Rocky River Reservation. 
And for the fifth straight year, Avon Lakes Eagle Pair, Stars and Stripes, welcome newborns to their nest, perched above Redwood Elementary School. A live Eagle Cam streams 24-7, providing up-close views of this season's triplets and their parents. But the western Lake Erie Basin has by far the most nests. Driving along the lake shore in Erie, Sandusky, and Ottawa counties, eagle nests are easily and frequently visible. At McGee Marsh Wildlife Area, north of Oak Harbor, two nests sit less than a quarter mile apart. Now you've got bald eagles reclaiming all of those historic wetlands along Lake Erie, along the estuaries, the mouths of the river. Now they're nesting along the rivers and streams, and now we have them nesting in the back of parks by baseball diamonds or over elementary schools. I mean, they're just turning up all over the place. So the bald eagle's name is Ashkate, but around here we call her Spaghetti. And if you give her a small mouse or a small rat, if she swallows it whole, the last thing to go down the gullet is the tail, and it looks just like a needle. Harvey Webster is Chief Wildlife Officer at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. He joined the museum in the 1970s, just as bald eagles were on the brink of extinction. In 1979, our Ohio population bottomed out with only four active nests. 100, 200 years before, we probably had 500 nests, maybe 1,000 nests. We were in a position where we might actually lose bald eagles entirely. To Webster, the story of the bald eagle is wrapped in contradictions. Named the national bird by our founding fathers in 1782, it didn't gain federal protection until more than a century later. Most predators in the 1700s and the 1800s, whether it was a mountain lion or a wolf or a bald eagle, were considered to be vermin. They were considered to be um, things that would cause depredation on your livestock. They, they thought they might be a threat to humans, and we wanted to do our best to obliterate them. So the 1800s is a century where we just have systematic destruction of our wildlife resources. A search for a more powerful insecticide than had previously been known was imperative. The answer to the quest was found in DDT. Webster says it was the introduction of the powerful insecticide DDT after World War II that almost doomed the birds. And the problem with this particular chemical, it has an incredibly long half-life. It just keeps cycling through the ecosystem, and you can't get rid of it, and it ultimately denies them the opportunity to reproduce by causing their eggshells to be so thin that the eggshells crumble. Even though these are long-lived birds, there's no one left to replace them. By the early 1960s, fewer than 500 bald eagles remained in the continental United States. A few years later, the federal government stepped up to save the national symbol. The newly formed Environmental Protection Agency banned DDT. The 1973 Endangered Species Act added protections against hunters. Habitats were preserved. At the same time, efforts were underway in Cleveland to aid the eagle's recovery through a captive breeding program at the Natural History Museum. One rooted in a most unconventional love story. So Carl Lutzman was a dear, lanky, quiet gentleman who had been hanging around the Cleveland Museum of Natural History for 10 years, starting when he was in high school. And the whole project was only possible because of the quirk of Martha the Eagle falling for Carl. As the science writer for The Plain Dealer, Karen Long followed the breeding program's progress. In describing the eagle's relationship with Lutzman, she writes, Martha presented Lutzman with an egg, putting the world on notice she would have nothing to do with males of her own species. In order to try to repopulate Ohio with eagles, you needed a producing eagle, and she was producing because she was bonded, made it to Carl. But I remember thinking, he's a young guy and he can't even leave because if this is going to work, he had hundreds of hours in the nest with her in February and March, and he stoically and in a lovely, low-key fashion was true to her, too. We thought, okay, we have an opportunity here. We could use techniques of artificial insemination and see if we could get viable male reproductive products from our male and inseminate fe the, the female Martha and see if we could actually get some cool legs. In 1984, roughly 10 years after the program started, the museum successfully hatched its first eaglet. And two years later, another. The 
point was to raise it, we puppet raised it so they wouldn't imprint on us, and then it was made available to the Ohio Division of Wildlife and placed up in a wild nest, really put up for adoption. In total, 10 eaglets from the museum were placed in wild Ohio nests and adopted by the adult birds there. We weren't just trying to breed bald eagles for the sake of breeding bald eagles. It was trying to help them in the wild and give them a leg up. We knew the environment was cleaning up. We knew as an endangered species, eagles got extraordinary protections of habitat and enforcement of laws that would give them a much better chance for the future. Once we had traction, which really occurred in the late um, 80s and early 90s, then they exceeded everyone's expectations in terms of how rapidly they came back. And it felt like a huge gamble to put all this effort into trying to coax this keystone species back. I, I didn't have very much faith that it would work, especially after 10 years of no luck. So the fact that the eagles are back is like a poem to the resiliency of nature. I could cry. <laughs> After a decades-long conservation effort, the bald eagle came off the threatened and endangered species list in 2007. A 2018 survey by the Ohio Division of Wildlife found 286 eagle nests in the state and an estimated 445 young. I mean, we were just hoping that eagles would survive in Ohio. To see them come storming off the endangered species list, to see them recover in every every definition of what wildlife recovery um, looks like. The bald eagle story reminds us that we might mess things up, but we can right the wrongs. So we can, in fact, conserve these animals. And I think that that is an important thing that a takeaway for everyone, that, you know, we can do this. We just have to care about it. Much like the bond formed between Martha and Carl Lutzman all those years ago, Chuck Anderson's affection for Eastlake's eagle pair endures through his photos and videos and through the eyes and ears of 18 kindergartners at Thomas Jefferson Elementary. Are there lots of eagles in this world? Yes, yes, lots of eagles. They've made a very big comeback. Staying in nature, we'd like to reintroduce you to a handful of folks who've turned their passion for the outdoors into a 